figure out because all the sites are different too. Um, what might what they might be doing to manage them, what they might not be doing. It's complex. Um, but habitat and predators are two very key things that you must have, you must be able to mitigate. If you don't have that, then not much else matters uh, what you're doing. And you'll see that's what we focused on. We go one more, Lily. So why are the plover nests fail anyways? What happens to them? Well, almost the full 50% gets predated by another animal, mostly mammals. You have red foxes, possums, cats, um, just about every mammal on the coast likes eggs and little baby birds, of course. Uh, you do have avian crows. Uh, crows love to take out eggs and they're extremely smart uh, and they figure it everything, everything we do, they figure it out and find another way to get to the birds. We'll discuss a little bit of that in a bit. And then ghost crabs, we don't really have a deal with much of those anymore. And there's some that just disappear and you don't know what happened. So there you have an idea of what's happening to these birds. Now the other thing it just doesn't explain is that um, if you just have terrible habitat, you, you, and they do happen to nest, that might be a cause of their failure as well. All right, Lily. All right, so another type of uh, beach nesting bird that we have at our preserve is called a least tern. Um, they're pretty small. They are um, state endangered, unfortunately, but we are working on that. Um, you may notice they nest in large groups called colonies. Right now we have two colonies forming on our South Cayman Meadows Preserve. Um, they typically prefer um, beaches that are flat with not a lot of vegetation, kind of similar to the plovers. We start to see them come to the beaches in um, like late April, early May. They did get a little bit of a late And they typically start courtship behavior early to mid-May. Um, it's actually pretty cute to watch the males do this adorable little dance for the females. They hold a fish and they present it to her with the hopes that she will accept it and they will be partners. The eggs and they'll be incubated for about 20 to 22 days and both the male and the female take turns incubating the eggs. So we haven't had, or last year was the first year in four years that we had successful chicks fledge. Um, we had eight fledge in total, which was really exciting for us because it had been about four years since anything was happening. Um, that number could have been a lot higher, but unfortunately on the 4th of July, we had some human disturbance because people were setting off fireworks on the beach. Um, Actually, on the 5th of July, I went out to go do another count of the colonies, you know, keep up with the birds. And I found so many, like, huge rockets, um, different fireworks that were directly in front of the enclosure. And as you can imagine, loud, scary noises, small beach nesting birds, it's not going to work out well for the birds. So at one point, we had peak adult count of 114 turns. After the um, firework incident, I counted about 20 to 25 turns still on our beach nesting in our enclosure. Hopefully this year we're going to staff the beach for the 4th of July so we can avoid this problem and hopefully get more than eight chicks fledged. So another species that we're looking to protect is the American oyster catcher. Um, they are a species of special concern because they have the potential to become either threatened or endangered. These birds are really hard to miss when you see them on the beach because they are very loud, they will make themselves present, and they have very long um, red-orange bills. It's really bright. Um, they use that to dig in the sand and, you know, eat mollusks and crack, crack open um, invertebrates, things like that. Um, they prefer nesting on beaches, dunes, and occasionally mudflats. The pairs that we have on our beach, they're typically up on the dunes. Um, one of them is in the enclosure this year, which is great. And we had one that was in our enclosure last year. It was the only nest last year that made it to hatching status. 
and the chick survived for I would say about a week but then the minute it left the enclosure it unfortunately unfortunately got predated um, so we're hoping that the the ones that nest inside the enclosure this year will stay in there a little bit longer and we'll actually get them to fledge. So these birds, um, they come to the preserve in March. They start nesting in late March to like mid early April. And they typically have two or four egg, or two to four eggs in their nest. Um, and the parents also take turns incubating for about 25 to 27 days. And a fun fact about their chicks is um, only two hours after they hatch, they can actually start walking and running around. Okay. All right. So that, that's as much as we'll go directly on the bird. We'll go into the project a little bit. And if you check out this map, um, I'll go through it, but you can uh, just read along. Uh, dead center in the middle is the project, Beach Nesting Habitat 2019. It's about an acre and change. What we did is, um, and you'll see um, what we did, but we cleared the vegetation. That's the project area we worked initially. Uh, it was a lot of work. Uh, and as you just saw, there was a hundred and some turns in it the first year. And we had plovers in the beginning, but it just, they, they left on us. But it was uh, successful. There is uh, to the left of that, the, the project we tried this year, much larger, almost three times the size. Uh, and we also uh, fenced that in. You'll see what I'm talking about in a second. So we have almost three times the size. Uh, we saw a piping plover a few days ago out there, as well as leaves turned. So we're hoping, um, and I think the birds did get a, large, uh, a late start. So we start seeing a bunch of activity inside the preserve. There's something we're calling Shell Island. We made it as a nesting roosting habitat. It was initially an idea. Uh, the beach is so just volatile. Uh, some of these birds just, they don't even have places to roost. So we have an interior island that's surrounded by water and mud. And we cleared the vegetation and put uh, just untold 70 tons of shell on it. And we were hoping that some birds would use that, maybe to nest, but, or just roost uh, safely at night. And we did have some uh, birds on it the first last year. We didn't focus so much on it this year because we were uh, compelled to work more on the beach. And then I'll just quickly mention um, somewhere around 60 to 80 percent of the terns in Florida are nesting on rooftops uh, because their habitats are going away. And we all know these kind of like rooftops and buildings have like little pebbles and rocks and stuff on them. The terns apparently like that and they're nesting there. So we are going to make a natural looking rooftop experiment out there and see if they nest in it because we want to cover all grounds. If, if let's just say a hundred turns use this rooftop one year and we get a storm surge, it comes in and wipes the whole beach out. Well, our birds are still fine. Uh, so it's just a, another experiment that um, we're going to try. So there's the preserve. There's the places we worked. Go on to the next slide. Here's the techniques. You can just go right through them, uh, Lily, that we used last year. And on the right, um, the, one, the things in blue are what we hoped to change, because we did learn some lessons from last year. So removing vegetation, that's A number one. They won't nest if the vegetation is too thick. That was uh, very difficult in and of itself. And we spread 50 tons of shell last year. We were going to spread 75 tons of shell. Uh, because of resources, COVID, and these other things, we didn't get around to doing that. However, I think still think it's going to work. We made the fence six feet. Uh, last year, I made a five-foot fence, so I'm like, oh, this is great. Uh, and then a local trapper said, you know, foxes can jump five feet. And I was like, oh, thanks. So this year, uh, making a six-foot fence, uh, we made one. Uh, taller support poles and an, an underground skirt, which you'll see, which keeps them from just digging under in the sand. Uh, we put more decoys out, and you'll see this uh, call, solar call box, which is super cool, and sprayed mammal deterrent. These are all our strategies to just keep the predators away from this area. Uh, and we, we wanted to erect these enclosures. It's just basically a big cage uh, with fake plovers in them to kind of kind of just confuse the crows, because crows will literally just fly down, grab even adult birds, and, and tear them up. We're going to hang crow effigies. Uh, if you don't know what that is, it's just a fake crow. It's really um, realistic. And you just put them in different areas. 
Um, it's been demonstrated to show the crows are so darn smart um, that they will figure it out eventually if you leave them in one spot. The theory is you just hang them out there in different areas. The crows, they get kind of freaked out. They go explore it, then they never come around again. They don't, they, they don't like the area. They don't know what. They can't figure out exactly what's going on. As long as you move these things periodically, in theory, I might be able to keep the avian predators, the crows, off our birds as well. It's just an experiment. I don't know how it's going to work. I'm sure I'll get calls about um, upside down hanging crows at some point. Uh, clearly, we're going to staff the beach at the 4th of July. That was critical. We didn't know people were lightning off a ton of fireworks. Um, yeah, and we're going to move the fence strategically. So, and, and we did all of that except for a couple of them. Next slide. So this is the area of beach where we had our um, first enclosure. This is the before picture before we went through and removed all of the vegetation. And then this is the after. So as you can see, we got rid of a lot of it, made it really flat and smooth, which is what the birds like. Uh, we did that by getting these attachments for our tractor. We had one on the front and one on the back. Um, and they basically just dig up the roots from um, beach grass, um, goldenrod, whatever might be growing out there. Um, as you can see, that's the one digging on the back there. And that's Damon on the tractor. And the next step was to add the 50 ton of shell. Um, this was definitely a lot of manual labor, but worth it in the end. The birds loved it. And this here is the fence that we're talking about. Um, so this one is the five foot fence. You might notice that there is a gap between the posts that are holding the fence up and the top of the fence. Um, we did this to kind of make it unstable, kind of like wobbly, that way birds of prey can't land on it, um, crows can't land on it, it's hard for them to stand on basically. And along the bottom there, you can see the skirt that Damon was talking about. Um, that was about two and a half feet long, and basically it prevents predators from being able to dig under the fence. Uh, we did also cover the skirt with sand just to kind of disguise it a little bit. And then all along this fence, all sides of it, is where we sprayed um, this type of liquid called uh, liquid fence. And it basically just smells really bad to mammalian predators and deters them from wanting to be anywhere near our enclosure. Um, the next thing that we did to try to attract some of the birds was we actually made decoys of the least terns. Uh, we did that by taking scraps of two by fours. We drew a uh, and cut out a rough shape of what a turn kind of looks like. And then we used a belt sander to actually go and mold the pieces of wood so they looked more like the actual turn. And then of course we went through and painted all the markings. Um, that way from an aerial view, turns will see it. I think it's a good nesting area for them to go. Um, we used fake decoy eggs as well, just to kind of, you know, add the effect of a um, good nesting area. And then we would install colonies of the fake tor uh, the decoy turns on the beach, make it look realistic by putting shells around them, makes it look like a little nest. And we put out the call box, which Damon will tell you more about. Yes, and just the, the uh, fence idea, just so you know, we were able to keep out every single predator the whole season. Not a single mammal got inside uh, where our birds were, which was quite exciting to see. Tracks all over the place, but nothing got in. It was quite amazing. Uh, another part of this is a call box. So ways you can attract these birds. Turns are colonial. They like to be in groups. They love another group of birds. They get in there and do all their chat and love it. So we put out small colonies of turns. If you also put out a way to call them in using their own calls, and just play it all summer long. Hopefully sunrise to sunset, shutting off at night kind of thing. This is the box we made. So you can see the amp, the battery. It has a little solar charger, an MP3 player. And it even has an, a, a ventilation system if it gets too hot. We really got fancy with it. And it plays really nice, crisp songs. And it just pulls the birds in. Uh, so they nest, they like it. And we eventually figured out we probably shouldn't play it at night. Uh, birds really don't make too many noises at night, plus predators come out at night. So we added timers to it 
So it would only come on during the day and then it would shut off at night and then come on during the day again. And it really worked well. And we also had plover calls in there to just attract them as well. Plovers don't nest in colonies, but they could at least hear another plover would be in there. And these boxes were fun to put together. We didn't want somebody just walking out and grabbing it. So we went a little Godzilla with it and it takes at least two or three people to carry it out with pipes just to get it out there. Um, and you'll see through the next couple of slides what I'm talking about there. There it is. It's on kind of a beach buggy. And, you know, it has marine speakers. It could sit out there for a year and just continually call if you wanted it to. Uh, it's just completely solar powered. And we carry it out, plop it down. Uh, and then what we did is we kind of painted it a tan color, sprayed it with adhesive, and then threw sand and shell on it. And it kind of just disappeared uh, in, inside the area. It's a neat, pretty neat concept. There it is from a distance. So yeah, it worked. It worked really well. So another idea I was I referred to was putting a plover inside a fake enclosure. You see the fence behind it. That's just a big circle. And the plover is in the middle of it. This is how they used to manage. Well, they still do in some areas, piping plovers. You find the eggs. You put a bucket over it, you put this fence up, it has a top on it, you close it up, you get out of there, and the mom goes back in, sits on the egg, and now it's protected. Great, you've just saved the bird, now it can lay its egg and fledge. Well, it's not the case, really. Crows, for example, have keyed in on these things. And they're like, oh, I know that's an enclosure, there's food. So they fly over, they even sit on the edge of the thing, stress the bird out like crazy, they wait for the chick to come out and then they just eat it. So, oh, terrible. So that's not done too much anymore. What I decided to do was put fake eggs, fake clover inside, don't put a top on it, and put these all over and just confuse the crows. It turns out, we went to inspect this after a while and the plover was gone. That same one you're looking at. It was about 60 feet away, laying on its side. So some, and there was no traps around the thing. Something flew in throughout the top, through the top, picked it up, probably went about 50 feet and said, wait a minute, this isn't real, and then dropped it. So I was just trying to confuse the crows uh, a little bit, not just another experiment. They're so smart. Next slide. Uh, just, yeah, so Lily, you can talk about this. Yeah, so this is the same call box that you saw a few slides back. Um, just some things that we learned from this experiment was that there may be very large, random, <laughs> and unpredicted storm surges that will flood your beach, because um, that's what happened to us. It basically turned our enclosure into a mini lake, and unfortunately, we did not take the call box out before this happened, because like I said, we did not know that this was predicted to happen. So it unfortunately destroyed basically everything that was in the call box. Um, the only things that made it out okay were the marine speakers. They're, they're still working. Uh, fortunately, we were able to basically just salvage every, or I mean, no, I'm sorry, salvage the box. We got rid of everything else and replaced it. And it's back out on our new enclosure this year. It's working great. Uh, but now we have everything, up, now we have our call boxes raised up about three and a half feet on um, pallets. And then we have our other box put up on a higher dune, just in case this does happen again, the water won't reach it and leave us brokenhearted again. <laughs> oh, another lesson learned was, um, so we have um, symbolic fencing that we put along our dunes and in front of our enclosures. And we use galvanized posts and roping for that. And basically it's just kind of a way to let people know you know, don't get too close to the enclosure, don't go onto the dunes. And at the end of every season, we take it down and we usually just stack the posts and, you know, come get them at a later day. Well, when that storm surge came, we realized that the posts were gone. So we thought maybe they got swept away, maybe someone from the state park came and cleaned them up. We weren't really sure. Damon had the idea to get a metal detector and it turns out that the uh, same so storm surge that ruined our box brought 18 inches of sand onto our beach and completely buried, what, 300 posts, I think it was. 
So that's another lesson learned. Once we get the posts up, just take them off the beach the same day so we don't have to go digging for them again. Yeah, and that, that storm surge, it's, it's pretty incredible to watch because even just regular old high tides now are coming right up to the symbolic fencing. Uh, it's scary to think of what's going to be coming in, in another year or two, five, ten, uh, as far as elevation of these storm tides. Uh, this is just a shot at the Shell Island in case you really couldn't see what it was on the map. You can see in that bottom left photo, it's just an island surrounded by water. And if we had it covered in shell and we put a call box out there, we did a little bit late, but there were birds using it. We hope to invest some more time into this, uh, even for just a roosting site. I think it would be uh, beneficial for these birds uh, and to see, if, you know, see if it works as well. So that's one of our chips from last year. Uh, and you know, the, the two main things I got out of the experiment last year was the realization that you can't do everything. Um, I spent a lot of time figuring out what's happening with these birds in different areas in the state, in different areas of the country, where they're going at home, uh, you, know, you know, in the winter time. And it was such a daunting thing. You're like, oh God, how do I, what do I do about this? Well, some of it is out of your control. You have to be able to, you know, work on your spot, do the best you can in your area where you're at. Your resources are limited. Your resources are limited. So that's what I decided to focus on. All of our energy, right exactly where we're at. Other people will work, you know, in, in other countries or, or do other um, things all over the state. We're, we are right here and that's where we work. The other thing was, if you have a predator problem, you say, well, what can I do about it? Oh, we can trap them, we can do this, we can do that. Um, we have all the vegetation, well, we, we can rip it up. And I found it, I, I, I'm starting to believe this more and more, that that is not the way to do it. That is one way to do it, but it, I don't think it's the way we're gonna try it. Instead of trying to deal with the predators, each predator requiring its own technique and all of that, I say, who cares what predators you have? Just prevent them from getting to the birds. Prevention is better than a cure most of the time. And I think that was the big lesson to me. Instead of trying to mitigate these things, just don't let them get to the birds. And the vegetation, just prevent the vegetation from growing. Um, and that it, it's not easy. You may say, well, great, just go out there and pull it up. It's not easy. Um, requires massive permits and stuff is hard to get out of the, out of the uh, sand and it comes back. Um, but I think prevention in this case um, is the best avenue. The other way to me was running around down a rabbit hole that was just, um, well, it, it's been looked at for years and years and years. So the fact that we were able to keep every single predator out the first year is very illuminating to me. That's why we tried it again this year uh, with the hopes that we do even better. And it's all we can do. We're doing everything we can possibly do. And that little chick is, uh, that's, that's a funny little thing there, but it's not too far off of reality. So I hope you enjoyed this. Um, thank you, Lily, for, for coming and helping as well. And, you know, wish us the best for the season coming up. Thank you so much, Damon and Lily. Um, so I have a few questions for you um, coming in through the chat and uh, being messaged. Um, so the first one is, where do you get the tons of shell for the project construction? Okay, the shell comes from Port Norris. There is a town called Bival. Um, his historically, they, they had more, to give you an example, they had more millionaires in Port Norris than anywhere in the country at one point, massive shell industry. They still have loads of shell. Uh, I just ordered it through my contractor. He came with a dump truck uh, and brought it almost to the beach. If we had time, I would tell you a little bit about the travails of getting 70 tons out on the beach with no real access. Uh, you know, it requires a lot of hard work, a little bit of cussing, or is that the other way around? I don't know, but it was daunting, but that's where we got it from, locally sourced, and it's clean. Great. So the next question is, what can we do personally to help shorebirds? Can we volunteer to monitor the beach on the 4th of July? Yes, you can. 
contact us for that. Uh, some other things, uh, you can, and I don't, Lily does this all the time. She's somewhat fascinated, or maybe not fascinated is the right word. Um, but if you go out on the beach and you start looking for a plastic, you will find it everywhere. It's, and I mean everywhere. Our beach is clean because it's not loaded with people. It's a, it's a private protected beach. You can walk on our beach, you can walk right through. You just can't stop and sunbathe and stuff because of the birds. But even our beach, I think in the first month Lily started here, she had a whole diorama of all these different colored plastics. You can pick that up and take it away. That's certainly something easy to do. Birds don't like it. They shouldn't be eating it. They're, they're attracted to it. Uh, that's one simple thing. And certainly any knowledge that you've gotten from us today um, and see the disturbance, you know, people, these birds don't like disturbance. Uh, not a lot of it. That's why you don't see these birds nesting in wildwood on the you know, main beach. Mm -hmm. uh, they have trouble with that. Um, but you, you can, I mean, contact us. I wouldn't be opposed to, we used to have plover docents, we called them, and people would just go out, not enforce our rules, but just let people know, uh, you, you know what the rules are because it's become increasingly difficult to do this. Um, and just to give you a quick example, I don't want to drone on with this, but when the state closed all the parks and, so, and most of the county parks, we decided that nature was pretty critical to people's mental health and physical health. You just needed an escape um, to, to just get away with your thoughts and, and soak in some of this beauty that's around us. We kept ours open completely. And our visitation skyrocketed. And it was great, but it was daunting. Um, Lily's the only one out there most of the time at the Meadows, and Cape May is popular. And it's just very difficult to walk a mile of each. When you get to one side and turn around, someone's sitting down with a chair. You got to go to the other side. You look, turn around, someone's out there with a kite. Uh, so we used to have docents that would just, you know, wander around and let people know the rules. Uh, it's certainly going to be extremely busy this year as well. Lily, you might have some more answers. Yeah, I'm actually going to interrupt you guys. We have a bunch more questions coming in, and I oh. see that we're already over time. Um, Damon, can you explain the population charts that you showed early in the presentation, uh, the source, New Jersey population, East Coast? All right, let me get to that. Uh, you mean the one with the ups and downs? think so. Statewide piping clover populations? Or the one our chart itself here that we made? The one that has the chart with all the ups and downs, I just got that from um, the Endangered Non-Game Species Program. I did not compile that myself. They have kept track of every of the population down to the last bird to the best of their ability. And it just, to me, that chart, if this is the one you're asking about, I hope so, it just shows how dynamic yeah, it is. It's just so dynamic that, you know, I would like to see a steady line across there. But habitats change, rules change, towns change, developments happen. Uh, it's, it's, I think this chart is gonna look like this for a long time. I, would, I don't care if it goes up and down as long as it's in the higher range. It's when it stays low is when it's really troubling. And you, you, I said this before, but you think it would be very easy to figure out. But if that was the case, that line would be straight. We would have figured it out. It's just not. Um, these habitats are tricky. This, this world is tricky. All right. Um, the piping clovers in two of the photos had bands. Um, do you know what those bands are for in terms of tracking or who's tracking them? The state. We don't ban clovers. The only thing the Conservancy bans are uh, we have ospreys that we ban, but we don't do the pipe and clovers. That would be the state of New Jersey, endangered non-game species program. And you can, um, I will dive into this for about 10 seconds, but tracking is, uh, banding is really cool. The benefit, in my opinion, at this stage of the game is you get people up and close to the birds to study them, for osprey example. Almost every nest, the person is up there banning them, but you have a person right there looking at the health, the productivity, you know, everything right there, and they're all volunteers, so that's great information. But banning birds, you only find out information off that ban if you find the bird dead 
or somehow you can read it from a distance. And some of them you can. Um, so it does, you know, what are the odds of finding the bands? Pretty slim, but it's given us knowledge over the years. So they, they probably, I'm sure they don't do it extensively to these birds because they already have stressors, but they still do it because it does still have some use. Um, but technology's gotten to the point now where you can put a tracker on a bird and follow it across half the world, basically. All right, I've got another one. Um, so why um, pilot this at an inhabited and well-used area? Would it be easier to do the experiment in an area that's not accessible to people? I agree. Um, if I had that area, I would do it. Unfortunately, this is our only beachfront, uh, this one mile of beach. Um, and most of the habitat, you know, a lot of the habitat is kind of like where we're at. There's people. Um, I think it's, it, I think we can't, we also can't ignore the reality of some of these beaches are going to have people. So you need, you can't just give up on those areas. You have to, sometimes you have to work in them and that's what we have to do. There are uninhabited areas, but we have to be responsible for our preserve and our birds. I mean, they're right there. If we can do something, we should, uh, you know, perhaps we could find another section that the state would let us work on or something like that. But to me, we have to have our own house in order and, and try to protect our piece of ground where, where the birds are landing and be responsible landlords of our place first. Great. I have one final question. I think then we're going to wrap it up. Um, I think this has to do with the Osprey cam. How long has our Osprey couple been together and how long will they stay together? Well, I don't follow them off camera or off season, but assuming that's, <laughs> assuming that's the same too, it's been at least six years since that, uh, that same platform used to be out by the beach on the backside of the dune for, I don't even know how many years, it never got anything. So we moved it up into the marsh and the first year we did that, we got birds. And they've been successful with chicks all but one year. Uh, one year, they just chips vanished, everything went away, the birds went away, don't know what happened, no signs of predators. Um, but six years, uh, at the very least, they've been, they've been visiting, yep. Great, Damon, Lily, thanks again. Um, before everyone drops off, we have a quick two question poll. We'd love you to answer. I'm gonna launch that now. Um, and again, thanks to everyone who joined. We're going to be sending up a follow-up email with a little more information, um, tips on things you can do, um, and we'll include how you can volunteer on the 4th of July if you're interested in helping patrol the beach. Okay, great. Thank you everyone um, for completing the poll and uh, we're gonna end now. Thanks again for joining. Thank you so much. Thank you.